Uh, who's keeping time for you? Me. Me does good work. All right. Uh, when you're ready, you can make me Flary O'Connor was, like many of us, a human being. She was born of a mother and a father, the stem of a new branch in the ancient and vast tree of life. Being the product of evolution by natural selection, her mind and body were formed in a way so that she could survive and reproduce. But she was also gifted with consciousness, a gift that enabled her to become more than the sum of her parts, and create many literary pieces that we enjoy today. However, like the rest of us, her sexuality still played an influential role in her life and works, and modern readers can experience this influence through O'Connor's use of phallic symbols. Before you default to your Freudian judgments on my imagination, remember that the usage and interpretation of phallic symbols are not the result of a perverted mind, but rather the result of a judicious one. O'Connor doesn't use phallic symbols to promote a hormone-driven sexuality. Rather, she uses the phallus as a universal link to express themes such as masculinity, strength, change, love, lust, and dominance. In 20th century America, the idea of a woman using phallic symbolism was considered to be offensive and outrageous, and O'Connor was well aware of this. Being the progressive thinker that she was, instead of censoring herself, she planned on writing what she wished in a way that would be considered acceptable in her time, and also be appreciated fully in the future. She decided to use a subconscious approach, creating felt symbols that were present, but not obvious. As anyone who has read the works of O'Connor can concur, her usage of phallic symbols is not immediately obvious. I assure you, they are there, and to prove it, I will pull back the curtains and reveal to you the thin layer of O'Connor's literature. To begin, I shall review what is arguably the most obvious phallic symbol in O'Connor's works, because it is clearly intended as a phallus. In O'Connor's short story, A Temple of the Holy Ghost, the two girls, Susan and Joanne, are exposed to a hermaphrodite and describe the experience to their younger cousin, who responds with the question, you mean it had two heads? The young girl is obviously referring to the fowls of the hermaphrodite, and here, O'Connor's usage of phallic symbols begins to reveal itself. O'Connor obviously had to include the idea of a phallus by introducing the hermaphrodite character, but she goes further than that by using it to give insight into the sexuality of the 12-year-old girl. The fact that this young girl thinks it is possible for a phallus to have two ends, while still being aware of what a phallus is, shows her unique knowledge and position where a vast majority of her sexual knowledge stems from rumors and gossip. Inversely, her knowledge of non-sexual subjects seems to be much more in-depth than that of her peers. This interesting inversion allows the reader to jump to the conclusion that the pursuance of sexual knowledge leads to a diminishment of the pursuance of academic, spiritual, and social knowledge. This conclusion matches well with O'Connor's personal beliefs, as her Catholic background encourages to disregard sexual thoughts in search of higher understanding. Moving on, O'Connor's phallic symbols become less obvious, but still noticeable if you know where to look. O'Connor's largest phallic symbol is hiding in plain sight, staring readers in the face. In her short story, Enoch and the Gorilla, the character Enoch is described as being especially childlike. However, his childish lifestyle is taken when he meets a gorilla, whom he quickly discovers to be nothing more than a man in a gorilla suit. This deeply rattles Enoch, and as a result, he takes possession of the gorilla suit and transforms into an entirely new person. If you consider that O'Connor does indeed use phallic symbols, you will almost immediately recognize that the gorilla suit is a phallus. The gorilla suit is strong, hairy, masculine, and primal, and while it does not necessarily adopt the shape of a phallus, its usage and meaning definitely makes it a phallic symbol. When the childlike Enoch is initially introduced to the gorilla, his innocence is lost, just like it would be if he were exposed to an adult phallus. The transition that Enoch makes from losing his innocence to becoming the gorilla is much like the process of puberty, and as he puts on his gorilla suit and rises from the woods, the reference to a young man experiencing his first erection and beginning his rise to manhood is clear. This transition could also be considered an allusion to the resurrection of Jesus as Enoch is figuratively reborn. As Enoch puts on the gorilla suit, he takes on the properties of masculinity, strength, and dominance that the phallic symbol provides. Additionally, just as there was a man inside the gorilla suit when Enoch was initially exposed, Enoch himself is inside the gorilla suit, showing that inside every man is a child, 
and the only thing that differentiates the child from the man is his phallus. <laughs> Another phallic symbol that is hiding in plain sight can be found in O'Connor's short story, Good Country People. In this story, the protagonist, Olga, has a wooden leg that, after much seduction, is stolen by the untrustworthy character, Manly Pointer. The wooden leg is indeed a phallic symbol, and a complicated one at that. The leg is long, hard, and made of wood, so it's obvious that O'Connor is trying to convey something phallic. What makes the leg very interesting is that it represents Holga's loss of femininity. She lost her leg when she was a child, and as a result, she was denied the life of a normal girl. Additionally, because of her leg, it is quite probable that men find her unattractive, so not only is Holga's femininity crushed, but her sexuality is dampened as well. The losing of her leg and having the wooden one is practically the equivalent of having a phallus, which is what makes this phallic symbol so interesting. When Manly Pointer seduces Holga and treats her in a romantic way, he is restoring her femininity and sexuality, so it's not surprising that he also takes the wooden leg that acts as a phallus to complete the transformation. Additionally, the name Manly Pointer is in itself phallic, consisting of the masculine and erect properties of a phallus. Since this is not his real name, as he chooses it for himself, it can be inferred that he chose this phallic name to make him feel more masculine and dominant. <laughs> Before moving any further, it is important to note that it is impossible to know the mind of an author, and therefore it is never truly possible to determine the exact meaning that an author might have. While the evidence so far suggests that O'Connor is intentionally using phallic symbols to enhance her writing, the degree of interpretation needed for these following phallic symbols allows for the possibility that they are unintentional. However, an important question to ask is whether or not this actually matters. When an author writes, they write to express themselves, but they also create an opportunity for others to express themselves as well. The meaning that the reader derives from a work of literature is just as important as the meaning that the author intended. And from what can be deduced from O'Connor's personality, it seems that she strongly believed in this ideal. Therefore, regardless of whether or not O'Connor purposely <coughs> inserted these phallic symbols, she is still using them in her stories to provide opportunities for readers to glean meaning that she does not provide. And this provision is an important part of her writing style. Although she is very religious, O'Connor is not afraid to mix in some phallic symbolism with the divine. An excellent example of this can be found in her short story, The Life You Saved May Be Your Own. At the end of the story, as Mr. Shiflet drives away, he sees a cloud in the shape of a turnip descending over him. He exclaims, O oh Lord, break forth and wash the slime from this earth. Rain then proceeds to come down from the cloud onto Mr. Shiflet. Ladies and gentlemen, it appears that we have a phallus on our hands. A turnip is arguably phallus shaped. And Mr. Shiflet addresses it as the Lord. But 629 is sitting uh, in the parking lot for the evacuation. But 629 is uh, in the parking lot for the evacuation if somebody could come out. Thanks. So it is probable that this cloud is the phallus of God. The phallus of God is symbolic of ultimate masculinity, power, and jurisdiction. And considering Mr. Shiflet's many sins, it is likely that it is following him in order to judge and punish him. When Mr. Shiflet requests that it wash the slime from the earth, and then it starts raining, the cloud fells is ejaculating, releasing the rain to cleanse the sins of the world. The association of ejaculation and cleansing is not uncommon, as when one ejaculates, they release the ingredients necessary to form new and pure life. There are some instances where O'Connor requires the ability to visualize a scene in order to recognize the phallic symbol. For example, in O'Connor's short story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, the gun that the misfit holds while speaking to the grandmother is a phallic symbol, although it is not immediately apparent. In order to see this symbol, one must visualize the scene in their head. O'Connor describes the misfit as squatting on the ground in front of the grandmother, using the butt of his gun to draw shapes into the ground. The only possible way for him to both simultaneously hold the gun in that position and squat on the ground is to hold the gun between his legs, and this is where the symbolism comes in. Because of the positioning of the gun and the thing that the gun represents, it's very probable that this gun is a phallic symbol. Because the gun is being used to hold the grandmother hostage while the family is being slaughtered, it is simple dominance. 
Additionally, because the family is being destroyed, it is possible that O'Connor is trying to say something about remaining faithful in relationships. Just as the misuse of one's spouse can result in a family being destroyed, the misuse of a misfit at this gun results in the grandmother's family being slaughtered. Considering the aforementioned phallic symbolism, it is not ridiculous to assume that there are many more phallic symbols hidden within O'Connor's diary works waiting to be found. O'Connor truly was a woman ahead of her time, using phallic symbols in a way that was both tasteful and useful considering her circumstances. Her use of phallic symbols proved that she was able to communicate with her primal nature and therefore connect to us at the deepest level without letting her emotions become dominant or give in to her sexual urges. It is quite probable that her strong Catholic faith assisted her in accomplishing what she needed to accomplish with her phallic symbols without getting out of hand. And as a result, we have been blessed with excellent literature that connects to us on many levels and can be interpreted in many ways. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and attention.